For some reason, it seems like no matter how much counter space your kitchen has, it's never enough. So today, let's build a kitchen island that adds some space and some style to boot on Timber Biscuit. So today, I'm going to build a kitchen island. And this isn't going to be your typical kitchen island that's going to be built from plywood. Instead, I'm going to build this one out of hardwood. And the hardwood for this build is going to be my favorite to work with, which is walnut. So for this one, I'm going to be using 8 quarter and 4 quarter stock. And we'll get into the details about where these pieces live here in a minute. So in this case, I'm not building this kitchen island for me. This one's actually for my brother and sister-in-law who just purchased a new home a few months ago and need some more space in the kitchen. And in her situation, she doesn't have a ton of space in her kitchen for a massive kitchen island, but she also doesn't have a ton of counter space. So I think this piece is going to solve both those problems by both not taking up a ton of space in the kitchen and giving her a lot more horizontal surfaces. Because the kitchen's kind of like the wood shop. If there's a horizontal surface, you're going to use it. So let's take a second to dive into the design. What they were looking for was a simple, elegant design that would sit in the center of the kitchen and give them some more table and counter space. So this island will sit at counter height and have a nice thick top along with two deep wide drawers for storage. It'll also feature this nice slatted shelf at the bottom that can be accessed from all sides. Now though this piece may look simple and reserved, the process to build this one and the joinery are anything but. But we'll cover those more in detail as we get to them. So the first thing I wanted to check off the list for this one was that nice thick top. And for that, I'm going to be using my 8 quarter stock. So now that I've got everything laid out in the way that I want, I went ahead and marked all my edges with I's and O's. And again, this is so that I can take those pieces over to the joiner and alternate the edges while I clean them up. The I edges will face in towards the fence while the O's will face out. And that'll give me a really tight glue up for when these boards come together to create my panel. From there, I take my planks back over to the table saw to trim them flush on the other side. Now what this does, it gives me a parallel edge from the jointed edge I just created. Because if I just jointed one edge, then flipped the board over and jointed the other, they wouldn't necessarily be parallel and we'd be building a panel that wasn't square. So with my panel pieces all trimmed out, I took some of my other 8 quarter stock over to the bandsaw and rough cut out some lumber for my leg pieces. Now I'm going to end up laminating some pieces to make my legs thick enough. So here I'm aiming for all my pieces to be about a quarter inch oversized. I'll get them to their final dimension later. The only real issue I run into here is that because it's summertime, the shop is hot. So once I've joined my off cuts, I can take those pieces back over to the bandsaw. Just be careful with longer pieces at the bandsaw. You don't want to squeeze too hard on that blade and pinch it. It's just like when I dated that girl who lived on a houseboat, but we drifted apart. All right, so with my tabletop pieces and my leg pieces all cut out, I could go ahead and get them glued up. And here I'll start with gluing up the top. Now, if I was really worried about alignment, I'd put something like biscuits or dominoes in the joints, but these boards are really thick and flat, so I'm not really concerned about it. Now to get the final thickness on my legs, I'm going to be laminating together some 8 quarter and 4 quarter stock. And I'll do a pair of them two at a time to create my four legs. So what I first do is lay down a healthy amount of glue, and then I use a brayer that's seen better days to spread that glue out. From there I'll just use a couple clamps to hold those boards in alignment, and then squeeze the crap out of them with some parallel clamps. Here I'll probably go a little overboard with the clamps, but I like to alternate my clamps along the length of the lamination to ensure everything squeezes tight from both sides. I think either way you look at it, that's a lot of clamps. So I allowed those pieces to dry overnight, and the next morning I could come back in the shop and scrape all that excess glue off. Now here I've saved your ears from bleeding by lowering the most awful sounding tool in the shop, and then from there I can just give everything a quick sanding. Once I had all the squeeze out cleaned off with the legs, I could take them back over to the joiner and joint one edge and one face to create a nice 90 degree angle. This again is why I left these pieces oversized earlier. The cool thing about doing it this way is that I can use the joiner and planer to get to my final dimension, which in my opinion is a heck of a lot easier and a lot safer than trying to trim these down over at say the table saw. A lot of woodworkers try to use the table saw to achieve all of their final dimensions, but I'm much more of a fan of using my joiner and planer when I can because A it's a lot less work than trying to push these through on the table saw and B the final result is a lot cleaner than the table saw blade. It's like when I asked that librarian if she had a book about Pavlov's dog and Schrodinger's cat. She said it rang a bell, but she wasn't sure if it was there or not. Alright, so with the legs dimensioned down to their final thickness, I can go ahead and cut the top down to its final width. And to do that, I am going to use a table saw. Now, if this piece was much wider, I'd probably use my track saw to trim it down. But when I can, I much prefer to use my table saw because I feel like it's a little bit more accurate. And speaking of accuracy, if you guys want plans for this project, let me know down in the comments. And if there's enough interest, I'll put them together. And now that I've finished that cut, I'll admit, that was a big board. Alright, so next it was time to cross cut this down to its final length, and to do that, I'll use the track saw. As much as I'd love to use a table saw for this type of cut, this board is just much too wide for that. So what I'm going to do first is trim down a nice 90 degree reference edge for my final length. 
I'm not aiming for one specific mark here, rather I just want a clean cut along the entire edge. And then from there I'll just rotate the piece, mark it to its final length, and trim it down. Now here I am targeting that final width, if not just a hair over. And when I say a hair, I mean about 1 32nd of an inch, or about a millimeter for my international viewers. And the reason I'm leaving that a little oversized is because I want to plane down to my final dimension with a hand plane. This gives me a lot more control over that final dimension, and it allows me to clean up the saw marks in the process. Plus, who doesn't love using a sharp hand plane? And if you're loving this video too, please give it a like. It allows the video to spread to more people, and I greatly appreciate your support. Thanks. So next it was time to lay out the mortises for the legs on the underside of the tabletop. And to do that, I'm just going to use a combination of combination squares. I really only need to set up one mortise completely, and then just start and stop points for my other three. And this is because when I set the edge guide up on the router, it's going to be the same for all the mortises. So once I have the fence locked in place, I can go ahead and plunge my mortises. And I like to start my mortises by plunging one hole at each end of the mortise. This gives me a start and stop point that I can both feel and see, which makes cutting mortises super easy. From there I can work my way cutting each mortise from left to right to make sure the router is pulled into the workpiece. Now because the router bit is trapped on all four sides in this type of mortise, it's not super important, but it's best practice to work from left to right, and I'll dive more into that later on when we cut our stop dado for our vertical partition. And the reason I chose to go with mortise and tenon joinery for the legs and top is just due to the thickness of the work pieces. A strong mortise and tenon joint is going to also allow for seasonal expansion, but it'll also help me keep things square for the remaining joints on the piece. And for that same reason, the difficulty on the other parts is going to be increased. And I'll talk about why when we get to those parts. But given the amount of strength that this is going to give the table, I think it's worth the trade-off. I'm not cutting these down to their final length now. Instead, what I'm going to do is cut them down after I cut in the tenons. This way, if I make a mistake on a tenon, for instance, I can just cut it off and no harm done. If I cut them down to their final length now, I eliminate that escape route, and I'd rather have that material than not. Like when my boss asks why I only get sick on work days. I told him, it must be my weakened immune system. So with my legs trimmed down, I can go ahead and mark out their orientation. And while I'm here, I'm also going to mark out the orientation for my tenon. This way, things don't get confusing later on. So to cut these adjoining tenons, I'm going to use the Pana Router. And if you watched the lounge chair build, you've seen a lot about the Pana Router already. So I'm not going to dive into too much of it in this video. But what it does is it allows me to cut precise and repeatable joinery. So while I could cut these tenons on the table saw, using the pan router just makes it a heck of a lot faster. I'm still working it into my workflow, but for joints like this, I think it's super effective. Another cool thing about using the pan router is it really allows me to dial in my fit of my tenons. So for these tenons, I want them to be tight, but not so tight that I can't fit a little glue in the joint. If the joint is too tight, it's going to just end up adding a bunch of stress to the piece, and we really don't want to do that. So with my four tenons cut on the ends of my legs, I can take my work pieces back over to the top and test the fit. Again here we're looking for snug, but not so tight that I have to force the joint closed. Something about right there will do just fine. Alright, next thing I get to work on that upper cabinet. So the first thing I'm going to do is just trim out all my pieces to rough length, much like we did earlier. The only difference being that I already planed this material down when I did the legs and top earlier. Again, since it's summertime and it's really humid in my shop, I wanted to give this lumber plenty of time to acclimate. So planning it down oversize a few days ahead of time just gives it a little space to work things out. From there I can just use my table saw to rip the boards down to their final width so that I can create that lower panel. And then from there we can go ahead and glue up the panel. Again here I'm going to use some type on dark to help conceal any of those glue lines so that we have a nice seamless panel. And we're done. And possibly the best benefit about doing it this way, quick panels. Next up it was time to rip down the back and side panels. And to do that, I'm again going to turn to the table saw. Now here, much like I did earlier, I'm going to cut all these pieces oversized. And again, that's so that I can hand plane back to that final dimension. And at the risk of sounding redundant, I'll just say that cutting all your panels oversized is a really good practice. A, it gives you a little bit of wiggle room in case one of your measurements are off. And B, it allows you to fit all your work pieces snugly into your project. If you go by a cut list, for instance, and just cut all your pieces down at the beginning of your project, you're never going to really achieve the right fit for your piece. So I feel like it's a much more effective strategy to work your way through the project cutting down the pieces as you need them. There are some exceptions to the rule, and I try to point them out in videos when I do make those exceptions and tell you why. But for the most part, you'll never go wrong cutting your parts as you go. And if you feel like these types of tips are keeping you on track, make sure you subscribe. I make new videos about woodworking projects, tips and tricks all the time, so subscribe so you don't miss the next one. 
All right, so with all my legs marked out with their final length and the table saw set up with the stop block, I could use my miter gauge to trim them down. And all I'm doing here is using the stop block as my reference piece, then clamping the work piece to my miter gauge and pushing through the blade. As we discussed in the loft bed build, as long as you have your work piece clamped to the miter gauge, you don't have to really worry about it flying off the table. Just take your time. And when you're done, you can hit the easy layup. And less you're me, and you choke. All right, next it's time to trim these panels down to their final length. But first I need to get the length for them off the work piece. So all I'm doing here is just taking the measurement from between the legs. And I'm gonna add about a 30 second of an inch. And the reason I'm gonna do that is so that I can sneak up on the cut. At this point, this board's the only one that I have that's wide enough that can make these panels in one single piece. And I really like that look if I can make it happen. So here, what I'm gonna do is just trim down my pieces and then sneak up on the cut. The other benefit of cutting them this way is that all the panels will have a consistent grain pattern because they all come from the same tree or the same board. And whenever possible, I try to use the same lumber for all my parts so that I have that consistent look. And then from there, we can slide all of our parts in. And as you can see here, the fit is super tight, which is something you'd struggle to get with just a cut list. Like when I got a new pair of gloves, but they were both lefts. On one hand, it's great. On the other, it's just not right. All right, so next up, it was time to lay out the joinery for the panels. And to do that, I'm just gonna use a combination square. So I work by marking my boards out all from the top down, as well as my legs from the top down. This way, all my marks are consistently placed. I find it easiest to just mark out all my parts at the same time, so that if my square is off, then it's consistently off on all my parts, meaning that all my lines are gonna line up and that all my joints are gonna line up. So with all my marks laid out, I could go ahead and plunge the mortises. And to do that, of course, I'm gonna use the domino. So here I'm gonna use eight by 40 millimeter dominoes, and I think that'll give this piece plenty of strength. So once I have all my mortises plowed into the panels, I can go ahead and plunge them into the legs. Now here I'm gonna offset those mortises slightly so that we have a nice quarter inch reveal around our panels. This will add some depth as well as some visual interest to the piece overall. Now, if you'd like to build a piece like this and you don't own a domino, another option here would be dowels. Just make sure to use dowels about one third the thickness of the workpiece you're joining. So with all the mortises cut, I could go ahead and tap in my dominoes and do the first dry assembly. And due to the nature of how these different joints are gonna align, it's gonna be more and more difficult to get this piece together. So here, just squeeze those panels in place and pop the legs into the mortises. And yeah, I'd say that's solid. So next up on the GAN chart was to do that bottom panel. And the first thing I need to do is just take a measurement. And again here, we're aiming for a 30 second over. And I should be even more specific and say we're gonna go a 30 second over our longest measurement. Since obviously we're going for perfection, but that's not exactly achievable, things aren't lined up exactly. But once we drop this panel in and we're a little bit over, it's gonna tighten up and squeeze everything square. But if we take that measurement off the front and it's shorter than it is on the back, when we cut down the panel, it's gonna be too small. So whenever you're cutting inset panels like this, make sure you're going with the larger measurement. And I'll also say that this type of panel is probably one of the most difficult to make. And it's because of what we just talked about. Whenever you're building something that has to capture another piece like this, it's really important that things be as perfect as you can get them. If one thing's off even a 30 second of an inch, things aren't gonna come together well and you're gonna spend a lot of time chasing that square. So my best advice for that is just to take your time, try not to get frustrated and work your way through it slowly. The old adage of measure twice, cut once may not even be enough here. You may wanna measure three or even four times before you make that initial cut. So once I've marked out and cut out the notches for the legs in the panel, I can take my workpiece back over to the bench and clean up that inside corner with a chisel. From there, I use a couple off cuts, cut to three quarters of an inch lower than the top of the panel and drop it in place. And if the woodworking gods are being kind to us that day, everything will come together and it will fit. And I must have saved up some good karma because our first test run was a success. Yep, that looks great. Next, we could lay out the joinery for that bottom panel. And I'm only going with mortises in my two side panels. I'm gonna omit mortises on the rear panel because I want that bottom panel to be able to expand and contract with seasonal movement. Another reasoning is because putting this together with dominoes in that rear panel would be nearly impossible. Because we have joinery running horizontally across the piece, there's not really an easy way to put things together if we put joints there. When designing this piece, I did consider moving the joinery into some different parts, but honestly, I just don't think it's really needed. There's gonna be plenty of support for both the bottom panel and the rear panel. It's just like the difference between a literalist and a kleptomaniac. A literalist takes everything literally, and a kleptomaniac literally takes everything. So with the bottom panel in place, I could lay out the through dado for that lower panel. 
Now I decided to go with the through dado here because I like the idea of exposing the joinery. I don't think that's always necessary or always the case, but in this application, I think it really works. So once I've picked out my proper discs of death, I could load them into the table saw. And when loading in my doom discs, I like to offset those blades as much as I can to try to keep things balanced. Then from there, I could just go ahead and plow the dado. And as I've said before, if you live in a country that doesn't allow for dado stacks, you can cut dados like this with a router bit. So with my dado plowed to just shy of its final depth of the table saw, I could go over to the workbench and use a router plane to get to my final depth. Doing this also allows for those little bat ears that you find when you use a dado stack to be eliminated completely. More importantly, it ensures that the depth of the dado is consistent from front to back. And then from there, we can pop in our workpiece and check the fit. I'd say we nailed it. Next, we can flip the workpiece over and align it to the bottom of the tabletop. Then from there, we can describe a couple marks so that we know where to start and stop our dado. Since this will be a stop dado, I'm gonna make it about a half inch shorter than the width of our bottom panel. And once I've set my router bit to the correct depth, I'll just use a guide rail to cut that dado in place. And I guess since this is in the center of our workpiece, you could technically call this a mortise, but for consistency, we'll just call it a stop dado. So again here, I'm gonna pull my router from left to right, and I'm gonna cut my first pass on the side closest to the guide. From there, I'll just nudge the router to the right side of the dado and make my second pass. This will help pull the router into the workpiece and away from the guide. From there, I can clean up any frayed edges using a chisel and then use that same chisel to notch out those rounded corners. Now, our vertical partition is gonna be notched anyway, so these don't have to be perfect, but we wanna get them as close as we can. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and cut that panel down to its final length. And then from there, I can head over to the bandsaw and cut those notches. Now I stopped my dado short on the front and back side of the top, so I'm gonna go ahead and notch out both edges of the vertical partition. Oof, it's starting to feel more and more like a mortise and tenon joint. I don't know, let me know what you guys would call it down in the comments. If it's a mortise and tenon joint, say mortise and tenon. If it's a stop dado, say stop dado. And if you start your comment with mortise and tenon or stop dado, I'll reply to you guys first because I know you're paying attention. And if you have no idea what you'd call it, just make up a name. Bonus points for creativity. But with the vertical partition in place, all I could think was, it's a good thing it came together. So with the majority of the cabinet together, I felt like it was a good time to go ahead and address some of these knots in the lumber. So I just mixed up a small batch of epoxy to fill them in and let the board sit overnight. As most of you know, I'm not a huge fan of epoxy and woodworking, but again, I think this application is perfect. And I had a couple recommendations in the video where we talked about that to try out some browns and knots. And I ordered some new dyes, so we'll try that out on the next one. So with that set aside to harden up, I go ahead and get to work on the slats for the bottom shelf. And the first step there was again to rip down all my boards. Now I've done a lot of furniture with slats over the years, and the only real tough part about doing slatted furniture is the fact that it's so redundant. It's really easy to drift off into your own space when you're doing something that's redundant in the wood shop. So if you're ever in that mind state, I would just caution you to take a step back and pay attention. Most woodworkers I know that have had an injury just weren't paying enough attention at the time. Let's remember that all these tools are sharp and spin really fast, so we gotta stay on our toes. All right, I'll get off the soapbox now. So with that last cut, I have the slat support trimmed down to its final length. And I'll say final length kind of loosely here. What I first decided to do was just cut that slat support down to the final width of the entire base. I just found it easier to lay out the joinery that way, but I will trim that down so it has the same reveal as the side and back panels. This way I could just mark out that same distance on the edge of the leg and I didn't have to do math. It's a small extra step, but I think it makes sense. Now because the slat supports are gonna have that same notched treatment that we did for the lower part of the cabinet, I had to figure out a different way to cut the mortise. And the best solution I came up with was just to use the pan router again. Doing it this way allows me to get a much deeper mortise than I could with just the domino. So while everything is still square, I'm just gonna go ahead and use it to cut my mortise in. And the other cool thing about doing it this way is that this mortise will accept the same size floating tenons as the rest of the joinery. So I don't have to make any special dominoes or anything like that. This will just fit with a stock domino. The only real big difference is that the panel router can go much deeper than the domino can. With that being said, I still think the domino is faster at setting up joinery like this, but there are certain circumstances where I just need to go deeper. So with my mortises cut, I could take the slat supports back over to the bandsaw and trim out those notches. And again, we're gonna do that exactly like we did with the top. The one tip I forgot to mention is that when making notch pieces like this, I like to err on the side of caution and cut my pieces inside my line. This way I can just use chisels to sneak up on the fit. If you try to nail it right off the machine, there's a good chance you're going to overshoot it, and then all of your joinery is going to be super loose. And like when I went to that costume party dressed as a screwdriver, it'll turn a few heads. So with the support strips in place, I could go ahead and cut those slats to their final width. 
I waited till now to cut the slats with our final width, because as we've already said, getting your measurement off your workpiece is the way to go. So with my meter gauge all set up, I could trim off the end, then cut down the slats to their final dimension. You probably noticed that I hop pretty frequently from my miter gauge to my sled. And to be honest, I don't have a real reason as to why I do that, but recently I've been cutting my shorter parts using a miter gauge and my longer parts using a sled. And I think that's probably the best strategy to go with as long as your parts aren't too wide for your miter gauge. So with my slats all trimmed down, I could go ahead and lay out their orientation. And laying out the orientation really just comes down to personal preference. I just try to make it look like a flowing grain pattern. Then from there, I could lay out the joinery for the dominoes. And again, this is one of those redundant processes, so we'll speed right through that. From there, I could transfer all my marks onto my slat support pieces and then plunge in all the mortises. And here, I think this is a prime example of where the domino outshines the panther router because I don't have to reset a jig each time to cut each mortise. I can just align the tool with my mark and plunge away. If I did this on the panther router, I'd have to unlock it and relock it every time, and I think it would just take a lot longer than I need to. So in this instance, we'll give the domino the W. So with the mortises cut in the slats as well as the slat supports, I could go ahead and cut the mortises into the bottoms of the legs. And again, we marked these out when the slat supports were at their full scale earlier, so we know they're going to align perfectly. From there, I could head back over to the assembly table and give everything a quick sanding. Since we're onto the final fit and finish portion of the project, I want to make sure that all the sanding is done, so there's no surprises when it comes to the final glue up. This also means busting out the hand plane and cleaning up all the edges on the slats, which again is one of those redundant processes. Though I gotta say, planing short pieces is probably my favorite thing to do in the shop. Alright, from there we can move on to the edge treatment. And for the edge treatment on this one, I'm going to be using a quarter inch roundover bit on all of my outside edges. And I think that's really important to think about when you're considering the type of furniture you're building. If I was building plant stands, for instance, I might leave hard edges on everything because humans aren't going to interact with it. But with something like a kitchen island that's going to be in the center of someone's home, treating all the edges is super important. Now, there are a couple spots on this piece where we don't want to round things over, like where that lower shelf meets that inside leg. So I'm just careful to mark those parts out beforehand. Next, I could get to work on the underside bevel for the tabletop. Now, my client here was real specific in that she didn't want a prominent chamfer on the underside of the tabletop. So with that in mind, I decided to go with a 70 degree bevel. Now, cutting a 70 degree bevel on a piece this wide is a little bit tricky because if it was steeper, I would just mount it to my tenoning jig vertically and cut the bevels that way. But with it being only 70 degrees, I had to cut it with the tabletop being flat on the table saw surface. So cutting the bevel along the table's length wasn't a huge deal. It just got really tricky when cutting the bevel along its width. Because I can't use my fence in this cut, I decided to create my own. And I did that just by clamping down a jointed board to the edge of my tabletop. If this was much wider, I'd probably use something like my bench to keep things square. But luckily I could use a really large square and reference off the front of my saw, then cut the chamfer that way. Either way, I erred on the side of being too short on those cuts. And I decided I would just finish off making that angle with the block plane. This way I could finesse those edges and get everything aligned on the underside. Plus, this also gives me a good opportunity to remove all those saw marks that would be more difficult to sand out. Whenever I'm planing end grain, I like to use a block plane because it has a lower angle, and it makes planing end grain a heck of a lot easier. The only downside is that it relies more on your intuition to know when to stop planing. But hey, I mean, sometimes, like a group of fat babies, you gotta pull out the big guns. You know, the heavy infantry. And speaking of the big guns, let's bust out that tenoning jig and I'm gonna use that to cut a steep chamfer on the bottom of the feet. Now this is the same exact angle that I cut on the bottom of the table, just mirrored. And I think it adds a more dramatic look to the bottom of the feet than it would if it was just the same chamfer. And then from there, I could bring the legs back over to the bench and finish those chamfers off by hand. Now I'm not increasing the angle here, I'm just rounding over that lower edge a little bit more and smoothing out the bottom surface. As I always say, you gotta treat the feet. And I think that's even more important with a piece like this that is inevitably going to get bumped into and pulled across the kitchen floor. I don't want to put all this work in to have the bottom of the foot tear out in two weeks. All right, next we're finally on to the glue up. And the first thing I decided to do was just glue in all my dominoes into the ends of my work pieces. This way we have one less thing to think about when the whole piece is coming together. And as you'll see in a little bit, the way this piece comes together is kind of tricky, so I'm really glad that I thought about doing this ahead of time. From there I could assemble the first part, which was going to be that slatted shelf. And gluing that up wasn't too difficult. And that's because I've tested everything out and it's all labeled, so I know everything's gonna come together the right way. But one thing I do when gluing up slats is I try to keep the glue squeeze out from going in between the slats. In my experience, that's kind of a pain in the butt to clean out, so I'm really careful in those areas. And yeah, I think that's enough clamps. 
And then from there, we were on to the big glue up. Now this one was a bit difficult to get together. Thankfully my wife joined me in the shop to help me get all the pieces in place. But with the right planning, thankfully it wasn't super stressful. There was a lot of clamps and pieces to coordinate, so I did do a couple dry runs before actually putting it together. And whenever you're doing a glue up that's big like this, I recommend you do the same. She's solid. All right, next on the docket was the drawer fronts. And to get that measurement, I'm gonna pull it directly off the case again. Then from there, I can head over to the table saw and rip my board down to its final width. I'll get the final length for each drawer front off the actual workpiece again, because while they don't here, they could vary slightly. And that's because that center partition may have drifted like a 64th one way or another. So whenever you're cutting drawer fronts, don't assume everything's gonna be exactly the same, but instead just take the 15 seconds to take the measurement. And if it is off a 64th of an inch, don't beat yourself up about it. No one's gonna know, unless you post it online and tell everyone about it. So with my width saw marked out, I could cross cut them over at the table saw, then pop the drawer fronts in place and make sure they fit well. Now here they're a little bit more snug than I'd like them to be, but at this point I want them a little snug because when I pop in those hardware holes, it's easier to center them that way. And to drive in those hardware holes, I'll just take the work pieces over to my drill press and bore them out. From there I can hit the top of the card scraper to really smooth everything out and reveal that final surface for the finish. And I'm doing the finish prep now, which is a little bit out of order from my normal workflow because the drawer sides weren't here yet. But rather than wait around for them, I decided to go ahead and finish the piece. So for the finish on this one, I wanted something super durable. So again, I'm going with Rubio Monocoat. And here I'm just prepping all my surfaces by vacuuming everything down and then applying a little bit of mineral spirits. Once that had dried, I could apply my mark and mix up the three to one ratio for the finish. And then from there, I can apply the finish with a Scotch-Brite pad, wait about 15 minutes, then wipe it off with a shop towel. And while I finish that up, let me take a quick moment to say that if you guys are enjoying these videos and you want to support the channel, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. There you'll get discount codes on plans and merch, an invite to the Discord server where we discuss woodworking and woodworking projects pretty much all the time, access to monthly live chats, and some free gifts. So if that sounds like something that interests you, check out the link in the description. And as always, thank you guys so much for your continued support. Your donations go directly towards making these videos. So, thank you. All right, so with that, the finish was dry and the drawer slides had arrived, so I could go ahead and get them installed. And for this project, I'm gonna be using Bloom soft close drawer slides. Now, I know undermount drawer slides might be a little intimidating to some people, but I'll address some of those concerns and try to address some of your questions. I think there's a lot of videos out there that make these sound a lot more difficult than they really are. So when you first install the drawer slides, the setback's gonna be determined by the drawer front thickness as well as the drawer box thickness. And there's a chart that comes with the slides that's super easy to follow. As for the drawer box dimensions, I think that's where people get hung up. Here I'm using 18 inch drawer slides, so the drawer box length has to be 18 inches. The width can change to whatever you need it to be, but you just wanna make sure that the interior of your drawer box is gonna overhang on the outside of the drawer slides. And then from there, you can build your drawer boxes in any way that you like to. You just gotta make sure there's a half inch gap between the bottom of your drawer box and the bottom of your drawer. Now I prefer to use rabbits on my two sides of my drawer boxes so that there's a seamless look when viewing the drawers from the side. Just make sure you take this into account when you're measuring out the width, because again, we want it to hang just outside of those drawer slots. So once I cut the rabbits, I just take the backs of the drawer boxes over to the bandsaw and cut out a one and a half inch notch off each end. And you just cut this to that half inch thickness of where the bottom of the drawer box lives. And then from there, we can just glue up those drawer boxes. And that's super easy because all we have to do is apply some glue in those rabbits, then just put the box together. From there, just use four clamps to squeeze all the joints closed and let them sit for about 45 minutes. So yeah, super easy. Now, when it comes to installing the hardware, I think there's a couple different options out there, which I'll leave some links to down in the description. But all you have to do is follow the jig's instructions and pop everything in place. At this point, the hardware is pretty plug and play, so I don't foresee you having any problems here. And once you have all your holes pre-drilled, you can drop in your clips and drive in your screws. The one thing I'll say is that when using these clips, you want to make sure that the adjustment on them is centered. This way, when you install your drawer fronts, you can go up or down depending on your needs. If you don't center them before you do the drawer fronts, you'll probably only be able to make adjustments upward. So just keep that in mind. From there, all we have to do is pop them in and check out the action. Now we can get to installing the drawer fronts. And to do that, I'm just gonna use a couple shims to give me even spacing all the way around and drive in a couple screws into my hardware holes. Just don't drive them in too far and risk marring your drawer fronts. Now I should have stuck a piece of tape or something to the top of the drawer, but I forgot to. And luckily I could pinch onto those screws to pull the drawer back out. From there, you can just pop the drawers out and then pre-drill some holes for the mounting screws. I think mounting drawer fronts this way is the easiest way to make sure you get your drawer front centered and you don't have to battle with any glue or double stick tape. From there, we can pop out our temporary screws, then finish pre-drilling the holes. Next, all we have to do is attach our hardware and slide our drawers back in place. And with that last drawer in place, 
Let's cue the glamour shots. You know, I love simple solutions, and this might be one of the more simple solutions I've ever designed. But with that, as you've seen throughout the build, there's a lot of complexity. A lot of times I feel like designers overcomplicate things. And when you get back down to the fundamentals of what woodworking and design are, the most elegant solutions tend to be the simplest. And maybe the best part about this piece is that it's built to last. Because no doubt in a humid kitchen where it's going to see a lot of wear and tear, it's also going to see a lot of love. And for me, that's what making furniture is all about. Providing that bespoke solution that can't just be purchased at a big box store. So if you enjoyed this build and you want to see more like it, check out this video over here next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as always, I knew this would work, and I'll see you next time.